man, it was quite a week, right? If you, uh, if you were connected in with what was going on uh, socially, if you were connected with, uh, if you had a TV turned on or a radio turned on or you looked at your Facebook feed, it was quite a divisive week, right? There was a lot of, a lot of division. There was a lot of uh, things, strong opinions being thrown around. And I mean, first and foremost uh, was this guy, right? <laughs> this is Gritty. If you don't know Gritty, Gritty is the new uh, Philadelphia Flyers mascot. And uh, when he was announced this week, the, the universal reaction was kind of like, hey, somebody should lose their job. This is like the worst mascot ever. It didn't make any sense. And then this kind of, uh, this sort of Philadelphia miracle happened where within 24 hours, the tide started turning and it became apparent that this wasn't like this huge mistake, but it was actually this incredibly genius marketing campaign where Gritty has gone viral. He's been on Jimmy Fallon, like, fighting with Ricky Gervais. He's been, he's got, he's got, uh, I mean, what was the last NHL mascot that anybody ever talked about, right? And so, um, and so he's become, all, like, the ultimate Philly thing, and that it's, he's something that people don't understand, they don't like, and that, that people in Philly can rally around and be like, hey, you want to go to Gritty? You got to go through me, right? So, <laughs> So we love, we love Rowling, and plus he's like a fictional character. We love Rocky. We like any sort of fictional character, right, that we can like put up there because they don't, they don't let us down. So anyways, that was, that was uh, the division is, is coming together, and I'm glad that it is, right? But, uh, but man, there was some, you're going to have to take him down or else nobody will listen to me, Emma. Like it's, uh, <laughs> it's just going to be the gritty show the whole time, right? They're <laughs> waiting for that eye to move unexpectedly or something. Um, but man, in the rest of the news this week, it was, it, it, it was tough, obviously, with the Supreme Court hearings that were going on, and um, man, just a lot of really strong uh, opinions and emotion, and, uh, and it was hard not to get sucked into it, but, uh, but here's what I would say, and I have no intention of going into any detail. I know it's our fifth Sunday. We got the kids in here with us today, and, uh, and I don't have any uh, interest in making any sort of partisan political statement, but what I would say is this, that, man, one of the things that I love about Riverside is that it, because of our diversity, because of our, our racial and ethnic and uh, economic and age diversity, uh, we bring a lot of different people into the room, and uh, so there's people that would uh, typically vote Democrat, there's people that would typically vote Republican, there's people that don't care about politics at all, there's people who care deeply about politics, and, uh, and my hope is, uh, I think that's a strength of our church, right? <laughs> and so my hope is that, that our, our connection to Jesus is, is the primary thing that drives the way that we speak and interact with one another, and that we, when, we, when we post things on Facebook or that we, we, we speak to each other, to, to do it in a gracious way, in a loving way, in a way that, uh, that is, is, is authentic to us, but that um, doesn't risk hurting somebody that we love and care about and that we would call brother or sister in the church, right? So, um, so just encouraging everybody to be on their best behavior, right? Um, but one of the interesting things that, that, that comes out of this is that, um, and, and you've all seen, you know, the, the very, the very super polarized, hardcore post in one direction or the other. And over and over again, the thing that, that I find more interesting is, like, I don't want somebody just repeating the same talking points that I've heard, all the people on the TV and the news and everything. I want somebody to say, hey, I feel deeply about this because it connects to my story. You know, here's what I know. Here's what I, I've gone through. Uh, here's what I've, I've been a victim of this or I've experienced this or I've been, been accused of something that I didn't believe I did, right? So, uh, man, that, if that's your story, I'm interested in hearing that because that, that draws me in. That makes me want to say, like, okay, yeah, like, that gives me a picture of why you're saying what you're saying, why you believe what you believe, and it actually draws people together rather than pushing them apart. And what we're going to see in, in the account today is that's essentially exactly what Paul does. Uh, Paul is in this situation where he's given an opportunity to, to speak and to defend himself. And rather than defending himself, he essentially seeks to build bridges and to bring people into a relationship with Christ as he's experienced. And so, um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that this will be really helpful, practically helpful for each of us today as we think about, hey, in my life, I'm going to have an opportunity to share my story. I'm going to have times where either people are aggressively opposing me and I have to kind of, kind of speak back, or they're genuinely coming and saying, hey, I, I want to understand why you believe what you believe. Can you explain it to me? And, and my inclination is that probably a lot of us struggle a little bit in those moments with, all right, what exactly should I say? Where should I start? 
uh, how do I communicate this profound truth that I've experienced and I believe, but, but how, do I, how do I present it in a way that somebody else can hear it and receive it and, and really see me, not just see this, this sort of, uh, this, this kind of distant, disconnected, linear set of facts, but see how this truth is, is interacting with my life. Um, I, I don't want to put you guys on the spot, but uh, David and Kyra are here. They, were, they got uh, baptized uh, at our small group a couple weeks ago, and it was awesome. It was kind of like a, a smaller, intimate setting in here, and, but it was awesome to invite them to come forward and, and have them share their story, not just Jesus was the Son of God. He died. He rose from the grave. We are for you, right? But to share what that story meant in their lives, how that unfolded, um, how they became aware of their need for him. It, it was powerful to see, and, and there's, there's power in testimony. And so my, my hope is that today that you will, uh, if you are uh, in a relationship with Jesus, that you will walk out with a clear understanding of how to share that truth with others. And if you're not at a place where you put your faith in Jesus, that you could identify maybe where you are as we walk along this journey, uh, if, the, if there's an area that would bring you greater clarity in kind of figuring out who Jesus is and what he might mean in your own life. And so with that, that context in mind, um, we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 21. We've been, uh, we've been at this for two weeks now, and we're kind of watching the unfolding story of the early church. Uh, Paul was a, uh, an apostle, a preacher, who went from city to city telling people about Jesus, and he helped grow all these churches. Uh, but the, the, the Jewish church um, that had historically always uh, held Gentiles as outsiders were very concerned that it seemed like he was uh, diminishing their laws and ignoring the things that God had commanded uh, as delivered in the Old Testament. And so he's headed back into Jerusalem, into the hornet's nest, essentially. He knows that he might die. He knows he might get persecuted. He knows he could be beaten or imprisoned. But he courageously goes forward, and he does it in a way seeking to build a bridge. When he gets there, he has freedom in Christ. He knows that, that salvation comes through Christ alone. And yet when they say to him, hey, we want you to, to do these ritual ceremonies and to go into the temple and do this purification, he's willing because he knows that he's free. He uses his freedom as an opportunity to build a bridge and say, hey, yeah, I'm willing to go and do those things. I have the freedom to do that in Christ. And so, so he goes in the temple seeking to build bridges. But what happens is the people, even though he made an effort to build the bridge, they reject him. And they, when they recognize who he is, they beat him, they throw him out of the temple, a, a huge mob scene ensues, and he's in danger of losing his life uh, when the Roman occupiers actually come, and they don't want to riot, and so they come and they grab him and they take him off uh, towards their barracks. And that's where we pick up the story today. Uh, it's, it's a lengthy passage. I want to read through the whole thing and then go back and, and dig into it. Um, uh, it will be on the screen, and you can also follow along in your Bible. And so it says this, it says, As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, May I say something to you? He said, Do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out of, into the wilderness? Paul replied, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of, of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people, and when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received a letter to the brothers, and I journeyed towards Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. And as I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I answered, who are you, Lord? He said to me, I am Jesus. He probably didn't say it like that. He probably was like, who are you, Lord? <laughs> he was probably like, who are you, Lord? Right? He was probably terrified, right? He was knocked off his horse, right? So, uh, so, so put yourself in the moment, right? I answered, who are you, Lord? He said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. I said, what shall I do, Lord? 
The Lord said to me, rise, go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand of those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our faith, or the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance. And I saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. He said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Up to this word they listened to him, but then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out with the, for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? He said, Yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, But I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. Man, a, a powerful telling of Paul's testimony, right? And so what I want us to think about this morning, or what are, what are the elements, what are the, some of the things, that, and I recognize it's unlikely today that as we're sitting here in church that some angry mob is going to come in, is going to grab you, is going to drag you out in the streets, right, uh, is going to be threatening to kill you, and that you're going to be able to, hold on, hold on, I want to say something, and that they will all fall silent as you share your testimony, right? That's probably not how it's going to happen for you. So, uh, so, so but I, what I want you to see is that if he could do it in that situation, if he could take people that were trying to kill him and he could take a moment and say, hey, can I just share with you just a little bit about what Jesus has done? Then it should free us to think about what would that look like in my life, in the opportunities that I do get presented with, with the coworker who, who's always kind of poking at my faith or, or questioning me or, or kind of digging at me or, or waiting me for, for me to trip up so that they can point out my, my flaws. Or, or maybe it's, it's a neighbor who's going through a really hard time. Maybe they've got a diagnosis or maybe they, maybe they have lost a loved one and they're just really struggling and you can see it. And God's opening the door for you to share what, what you've gone through. Or, or, or maybe it's, it's somebody who's, who's expressing a desire to know who Jesus is and just wants you to lay it out for them in a clear way, right? The, the opportunities are going to come in your life. And so there's some powerful things that we can learn from what Paul did that we can bring to the table when we have those opportunities. And I would say this, don't, don't try and manufacture the opportunities. God will bring the opportunities that he wants for you, right? If you're looking for him, if you're praying for him, those opportunities are going to present themselves. The question is, are we going to step into them when they arrive? So the first thing that we see Paul doing is he creates common ground and he deals with their false assumptions. And he's got a lot of work to do here, right? <laughs> there's, there's not a lot of common ground in the moment for, for the person who's being, uh, being dragged out by the mob and stoned and, and within an inch of his, his losing his own life, right? That, that it's hard to build a bridge with those that are persecuting you. And yet we see him do this in a powerful way. First, uh, he does it by language, right? He, he speaks in a language that they can understand. And so he begins by going to the, uh, the Roman uh, tribune and, and he speaks to him in Greek, and that, that communicates, that gives him the, uh, the privilege of being able to interact with him and ultimately to have the, the, the right to be able to speak, right? But then as soon as he stands up to speak to the crowd, he doesn't speak to them in Greek. He speaks to them in Hebrew, in their native language. It communicates, hey, I'm one of you. I have an opportunity. Uh, you, you should listen to me. Like, uh, this should buy me a little bit of credibility 
with you. Uh, they accused him of being this, this uh, Egyptian who led 4,000 assassins out into the, the desert. This, this group was called the Sakari, which meant dagger men. And it was like they would go through and they would find those that were, uh, that were collaborating with the Roman Empire, like tax collectors, and they would, they would go with uh, knives in their robes and they would go up into the marketplace and they would just take them out, right? They were, they were these vicious men. And so that's who they thought Paul was. He thought he was the leader of this group. Um, man, uh, uh, have you ever been falsely accused of something, <laughs> right? Probably not of being an assassin, um, I mean, if you're going to be falsely accused, that's kind of a cool thing to be accused of, right? But, uh, but, but I, I get much less boring things, right? But, but he, he deals with these false assumptions. He says, hey, first of all, you need to know who I am before I can begin uh, to speak to you. He calls them brothers and fathers when he talks to the crowd. And he talks in Romans 9 about his, his intense love. And he, and he even goes so far as to say, I could wish that I would be accursed so that... So that that my brothers and my fathers would enter in because they are Israelites and to them belong the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all. Essentially, Paul says, I, I'm not doing this out of spite. I've never been opposed to you. I love you and if I could, if I could find a way to, to give you the salvation that I have, I would, I would do it. And to its discredit, the church at different seasons and times has been very anti-Semitic, right? Like in, in church history, there are, there are things that are, that are deplorable where the church was opposed and, and persecuted the Jews. But, but if you look in the Bible, what the Bible says is, hey, uh, the Gentiles were blessed by the Jewish rejection of Christ. How much more so will they be blessed by the Jewish acceptance of Jesus, right? And so that there's, there's a real opportunity to build a bridge, that God is a unifier. He wants all. He's not willing that any should perish or that anyone uh, should show favor over another. He even relates and he says, he says, hey, I used to be zealous for God just as you are this day, <laughs> right? I mean, that's kind of a mild understatement, right? They, they had drug him out into the street. They were beating him and trying to kill him. And he's like, hey, I noticed you guys are pretty zealous, right? Like, uh, that's, a, that, that's kind of an understatement, right? They were incredibly zealous. But he says, hey, you know what? I used to be just like that. I used to think that I was doing what God wanted me to do, and I was so anxious to do it that I used to drag Christians out of their homes and I would, I would stand over and oversee while they were stoned to death or dragged off into prison and tortured. I, I get it. I understand your passion. I understand that you, you think that you're doing what's right before God, but, but I used to think that too. Right? So he's, he, he's not accusing them. He's not saying shame on you. <laughs> he's saying I get it. He talks about common people that they would know, Gamaliel, the high priest, the council of elders, Ananias, these are people that would, would build bridges relationally. And so the first thing that I want you to think about today is, as you think about those that God may offer you an opportunity to share your journey with, what are the ways that you can build some common ground? What are the things that you can look at and say, and you might think, man, I don't have anything in common with that person, but, but it's, at its deepest roots, people are pretty simple. We're looking for acceptance. We're looking for purpose. We're looking for love. We're looking for identity. We're looking for hope. And when you can get down below the superficial differences and see, man, that's all what, we, what we all really want. I, I shared uh, several weeks ago when we were on vacation this summer, we were at a hotel and, and ended up sitting for breakfast with a man who was originally from Egypt and now living in California, and he was Muslim. And so right off the bat, he said, hey, I just want you to know, I'm not a terrorist. I'm not, I'm not trying to kill you, right? <laughs> And I was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> and I was like, hey, and, and I'm a Christian, and I don't hate you, right? And so our conversation, which became a fruitful one, began by dealing with those false assumptions, by trying to build some common ground. And, and, and once we got those, past those initial assumptions, he, he assumed that I would be judgmental and that I wouldn't even want to talk to him and that I wouldn't want anything to do with him. And he assumed that I had presuppositions about who, who he thought I, I would think he was. And once we dealt with that, then we could get into a real conversation. And, and what I found is that, that he was seeking to be a good man. And so he was talking, laying out his record of like, hey, I think it's just about, you know, whatever religion you're in, it's just about, about doing what's right and doing what's good. And if you're a good person, you'll, you'll be right with God and it'll be okay. So ultimately what he was seeking was to be right with God. 
And so it opened the door for me to say, like, hey, I'm seeking to be right with God too. But, but what the Bible says is actually that, that even our best works, if we're honest with ourselves, fall short of God's perfect expectation. And so that's why Jesus had to come and die for us. And so, so we were able to build the common ground of we both wanted to be right with God. And that enabled us to go forward and to have a conversation. Be aware that, that when you come as a Christian, people are going to have some expectations, right? They're going to think that you're judging them. They, they said a couple weeks ago on the radio, like, oh, hey, which Philadelphia Eagle would you like to have over for a barbecue and some brews and just kind of hang out or whatever? And they're listing all these guys. And, and the one guy's like, yeah, well, Carson, would you want to have Carson Wentz over? And like, ah, I don't know, man. <laughs> if I had like one too many beers, I feel like he might be sitting over there judging me. And like, you know, I don't, I don't know if I want to, you know, I don't know if he would be the best one. To, right? That's the assumption. I think Carson Wentz would probably be awesome to hang out with. You know, he'd probably be my first choice, but maybe we're coming from a different perspective, right? But that, the assumption is that Christians are going to judge other people, that they look down their nose at other people, uh, that they don't accept other people, that they don't love other people. And, and, and for the people in this room that I know, I know that's not who you are. And so you've got to understand, like, maybe I've got to overcome that. Maybe I've got to demonstrate to them that I'm not judging them before I can begin to have a meaningful conversation with them. So we begin by building bridges. The second thing that we see is that, that he speaks about how he pursued his own righteousness, how he pursued righteousness on his own. He said, hey, I was very zealous for God. I wanted to please God. I wanted to be righteous before God. And so what I believed that meant was, was rooting out this false belief called Christianity, the way. I wanted to end it. I wanted to snuff it out. And so I went from town to town, rounding up all the people that were followers of Jesus and dragging them off to prison because I believed that's how God would approve of me. That's what I believed, what I believed would make me right in his eyes. But I, but I was wrong about that. Right? He was pursuing his own righteousness. Now, if you grew up in church, you're likely to have a, a set of religious and moralistic sort of rules that help you to feel like you're right with God. Right? So, hey, if I go to church every Sunday, and if I, if I, if I say prayers, if I give a certain amount of money uh, to the church or to charity, if I do these things, then I feel like I'm right with God. If I, if I take the Lord's Supper, as we're going to today, that, that makes me feel like I'm right because I've done this, this ceremony, this act, this ritual. If you come from a non-religious background, if you didn't grow up, in a church, if you didn't grow up in, in any sort of religious community, then, then your righteousness is more likely to be derived from, from your own set of moral standards. Hey, I don't judge other people. Uh, I live and let live. I love and I accept everyone. That's what makes me righteous. That's what makes me a good person. Or my accomplishments. I've made a name for myself. Hey, I, I did this. I, 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 I built my own business. I, I made this much money. I, I accomplished this thing. I graduated from this place. I built a, a, a resume and a reputation for myself. And, and, and we're all seeking to establish our righteousness in one way or another. We just have different sets of things that we measure it by. And so you have to be honest with that. Are you willing to be honest with yourself? Can you see how you were failing to attain righteousness in your own ways. If this isn't part of your testimony, then it might be possible that this is, I, we've identified exactly where you're at in the journey, right? You've been around Jesus. You've heard about Jesus. You've, you've, you've understood what the gospel says, but you haven't yet come to the fact that you're insufficient to do it in your own strength. That the righteousness you've been trying to build in your own life is not good enough. And a lot of times, what leads you to that realization is a great failure, that's what it was in my own life, right? I, I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, by the grace of God, my parents taught me, and, and, I, and I, by my own estimation, I was doing really good of keeping the rules, of being a good person, of being righteous before God. Uh, and I was also building a resume of success. I was a, I was a straight, a, straight A student, and I, and I graduated really high in my class, and I, and I went to college, and I was a star athlete, and, I, and every, life kind of came easy. I did a lot of things really well, and it wasn't until uh, two years out of college when I didn't have any sort of career job, I was basically just taking any job I could to kind of make money to get by. And I, I had an accident and I lied about how it happened and my moral record was crushed. And I kind of, everything that I had relied on to say Ezra is a good person was removed. <laughs> and, and then God was like, okay, now you're at a place where we can start rebuilding on the right foundation. If you recognize that your own righteousness is not sufficient, then you're prepared to receive the righteousness that I want to give to you. Have you had that experience? Have you reached that place? Or is your testimony more along the lines of like, hey, I was like a pretty uh, talented uh, 
part of the draft class coming out, and Jesus was really lucky that he drafted me onto his team because I brought a lot to the table, and I jumped over to Team Jesus, and now, like, the two of us, we're, we're crushing it, right? Like, if that's how you think about your Christian journey, maybe you need to, to, to do some introspection and reevaluate your own righteousness. We sang a variation of the song Amazing Grace this morning. It was written by a guy named John Newton. John Newton was actually the captain of a slave trading ship. And uh, on his tombstone, these are the words that he wrote to be put on his tombstone. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. Those are the words of a man who understands himself and can write amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. If we don't understand our need for Jesus, we're not going to understand everything that he gives to us. And so if you're the hero of your own testimony, <laughs> then you're essentially saying, hey, I'm up here and you're down here. You should come up to where I am because it's great. You're going to have to work hard, but if you can get up here, man, it's pretty awesome, right? <laughs> That's not a testimony that will win people. That's not a testimony that will convince people. That's not a testimony that will speak to people. Because deep down, we're all aware of our brokenness. If we're willing to be honest with ourselves. The third thing that he shares is, is how he came to know Jesus. And I say that specifically because it wasn't how he became aware of Jesus. It wasn't how he came near to Jesus. It wasn't how he heard about Jesus. It wasn't how he was introduced to Jesus. Because uh, Saul certainly would have been aware of, of, of the man Jesus. It's possible their paths crossed during Jesus' ministry. Uh, he certainly was aware uh, of his teachings and his followers. And so Saul knew a lot of facts and information about Jesus, but he did not know Jesus. And it wasn't until Jesus appeared to him and spoke to him that his life was completely transformed. How did you come to know Jesus? Have you had a moment of knowledge of him where you just became aware in a powerful way that he is exactly who the Bible says he is in a way that you couldn't deny it, in the way that you knew it was true? Was it in a sermon? Was it reading a book? Was it reading the Bible? Was it a discipleship or in a small group Bible study? Was it in a dark moment of deep trial, in a moment of struggle, in a moment of weakness and brokenness? Was it in a moment of, of total failure? What was it? Is there something in your story that could say, man, I came to realize that Jesus is exactly who he said he did. Not everybody's story is as dramatic as Paul's. In fact, almost no story is, right? <laughs> he was opposed. He was an enemy of Jesus. He was persecuting Jesus' followers. Jesus appeared to him and said, hey, you're persecuting me. Knock it off. <laughs> And he becomes one of his most faithful followers. But in that story, we see what the Bible says is all of our story. The Bible says that we were enemies of Christ and he died for us. The Bible says that we were dead in our sins and Jesus made us come alive. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, that's a, that's a part of your story. Spend some time thinking about that. If you feel like your testimony is kind of like, hey, you know, I've just kind of always gone with the flow and yeah, like I believe it. Um, Push into it. Have you, have you dealt with the sin in your life? Do you need Jesus? Not do you just want Jesus, but do you need Jesus? Are you, are you lost without him? The Bible encourages us to work out our, our, our salvation with fear and trembling, right? <laughs> that, that, we should, that we should push in and say, man, Jesus, I need to, to, to be at a place where I have no plan B. Paul shared how he came to know him that way. And many, many of the moments in a, of trial in our life, many of the, the most difficult and trying moments in our life are, are moments when, when Jesus is trying to tear down the idols that are, that are vying with him for top position in our heart. Right? Yeah, if there's something that you're putting your faith and your dependence on, sometimes in God's love and grace and mercy, he'll remove that so that you can't rely on it anymore and you have to look to him. And he does it because he loves you, but it's never, ever enjoyable when you're going through it. The Bible says consider it all joys when you go through various kinds of trials because we don't naturally feel like it's a joy, right? But you have to consider it as a joy. 
The fourth thing that we see is that he shares how knowing Jesus changed his life. How knowing Jesus, everything changed for him. He was set on a completely different course, right? He had a new task. He had a new purpose. He had a new identity. Jesus said, you are now a witness for me to everyone. That's your job. That's your purpose. That's your task. And he set out to do it. And it's important to realize and to recognize. He said, Saul, uh, I've set you aside for this task. I've claimed you as my own. You are now mine. And then Ananias says, okay, that's all true. So what are you waiting for? Go get baptized, right? Baptism doesn't save him. It's not like he was saved and that's how he, he, you know, it wasn't like baptism when he was baptized. Suddenly that's him. He was saved by Jesus. Jesus saved him. Jesus called him as his own. Jesus gave him a new identity and purpose. And he was baptized as a symbol of that fact. He said, hey, you've been saved by Jesus. You've got a new purpose and stuff. What's holding you back? Go get baptized, right? For some of us, that that might be the, the next step today, right? To say like, hey, I know Jesus has called me, but I've never been baptized. Your next step might be pretty clear, right? How has knowing Jesus changed your life? Did it give you a new purpose, a new identity, new values, a new view of sin? Have your love and empathy changed? Do you notice uh, the fruits of the Spirit growing in your life in a way that that weren't there before? Um, You know, by God's grace, I'm in this process of sanctification where I can see a difference between who I was and, and, and who I am. I'm not, I'm not perfect, and I got a long way to go, right? So, but, um, but I used to have a much shorter temper. I used to be much more proud. I used to have a much more high opinion of myself. I used to get angry really quickly. And, and, and by the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit, I can see those things being removed. And it's not because I'm working hard at it and getting it. It's, it's as, as my love for Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit come in and, and take over territory in my heart, those other things just get pushed out. They just get pushed to the side. It's the work of God. In me, what does that look like for you? How's your life different because you followed Jesus? What's changed? Because that's what people want to know, right? If, if somebody says, hey, I just started this new exercise program. It's awesome. I'm doing this. Here's the facts. I get up at this time. I do these. Ultimately, you're going to be like, okay, so what's different? <laughs> Did you lose weight? Do you have more muscle? Do you have more, you know, are you healthier? Do you feel better? Do you have more? If none of those things are true, I don't care what you were doing, right? People want to know. Does it make a difference? And then he comes to a part where he shares a hard truth. And ultimately, when we're sharing Jesus with people, when we're sharing uh, uh, it's love, it's hope, it's, it's an invitation. But if it's only ever that, if it's only, man, God loves you, he just wants you to come to him, that, and we never get to the point of saying, and he has a righteous standard that he holds us to, and it's revealed in the Bible. And so ultimately, if you're following Jesus, it's going to lead you to the Bible. Uh, are you willing to, to share what's hard? Yeah, they weren't offended by anything that he was saying until he got to the part where he said that God sent him to the Gentiles. As soon as they heard the word Gentiles, that was, they were triggered, right? They, like, they threw him out. They went nuts. They started throwing dust in the air. They went crazy, right? It's like, it's like wearing a Cowboys jersey into, into the link, right? Like if you want to trigger somebody, right? Like that was, that's all it took for them. That was their thing. But he had a hard truth to share. Hey, this, this, this faith is not closed now to the nation of Israel. God has opened the door to the Gentiles to come in. And I love you, and it doesn't diminish his love for you, but, but he's doing something new. What does that look like in our culture? What are some of the, the hard truths that we have to get past, right? Related to, to just our, our, our physical relationships with each other. Related to our, our forgiveness that God calls us to. Re- related to uh, the, the reality of absolute truth. That we don't get to choose truth. That God assigns truth. Um, these are unpopular in our culture. But ultimately, if we're really loving somebody. But, but let, me, let me point out, he didn't start there, right? <laughs> this is step five. So by doing these things, he's built a relationship of authenticity that buys him the right to share this. But it leads us to the, the sixth thing, which the, ultimately is God is in control. Paul did an amazing job of sharing his testimony. And how many conversions are, are recorded from this one? <laughs> Zero, right? The crowd went nuts. They wanted to kill him. And it wasn't because Paul was disobedient, and it wasn't because Paul didn't do what God called him to do. And then, and then the Romans were going to flog him, which uh, was a way to torture people to get answers out of them, but a lot of times ended up killing them. But God provided a way of escape. 
He said, hey, I've given you a gift. It's, it's your Roman citizenship. Use that. <laughs> Use the gift you've been given. God is in control. The results are up to him. You may share with somebody, you may pour your heart out to somebody, and they may just coldly walk away, or they may angrily come at you. You can't control that. Only the Holy Spirit changes hearts. We're just called to be faithful in our, in our proclamation of what God has done and leave the results up to him. And, and if, if sharing it gets you into a difficult spot, God is with you. He's going to provide a way out. He's going to provide, provide a source of encouragement. He's going to provide some sort of rest for you. He did it for Paul. He will do it for you. Well, we're going to conclude today by, by taking the Lord's Supper together. I'm going to invite the band to come into place, and I'm going to invite those that are helping us to, to come and grab the elements and get into place. And here's what I want to encourage you, that, that the Lord's Supper is a physical expression of, of this reality that we just, it's a physical reminder of Jesus' body, which was broken for us, and Jesus' blood, which was poured out for us. And so that's why we encourage you that if you are exploring the Christian faith, if you're trying to figure out whether you're interested in Jesus, but you've not yet placed your faith in him, I would encourage you, uh, don't come and take the elements, because essentially by breaking off the piece of bread and dipping it in the cup and eating it, you're essentially saying, Jesus, I believe you gave your life for me. I believe that because of you, I'm forgiven. I believe that because of you, I'm saved and accepted by the Father, and I accept it. It's a physical way of coming and doing that. If that's not true of where you're at, I would encourage you, don't, the Bible says, don't, don't come and do it just out of ceremony, just out of ritual, just out of habit, but do it as a declaration of your faith. Um, it, and, uh, and I would encourage you that, man, if, you, if God has written a story in your life, Learn how to share it. And, and if you're still saying, hey, you know what? I got hung up on one of those. I'm not, I'm not sure if I've, I've sorted that one out. I feel like maybe I am still trying to pursue my own righteousness. I feel like maybe I haven't really known Jesus in a way that is saving, that is transformative. Pray about that. He, it says, knock and the door will be opened. Ask and he will come in. Pray today. Say, Jesus, I, I want this. I want what he's talking about. I want it today. And today could be your day where you enter into salvation. Let's do this. I'm going to invite you to stand. I'm going to pray over us. Uh, take a few moments in your seat. Reflect. If there's things in your life that you need to repent of or ask for forgiveness, pray. Ask the Lord. And then when you're ready, you may come and you may take the elements. And our band is going to lead us in worship while we're doing this. And then you can enjoy in worship. But, but join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for today. Um, we thank you for Paul's example, his courageous example of being willing to share the truth, to take the opportunity, even in a maddened crowd that was trying to take his life, that his love for them was so great that he wanted to stop and, and save some if he could by sharing the truth. God, I know you have appointments ordained for us. I pray this week that you will give each of us, that you will open doors for us to share our story and that when that moment comes, that we would share in this way that Paul laid out, that, that he showed us a pathway, a way of, of building relationship and, and sharing truth in a way that draws people in. I pray that we would follow that example um, and trust you to do what only you can do to change people's hearts. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a moment and reflect, and when you're ready, you may come and take the Lord's Supper.